Bueno, buenas tardes. Vamos a iniciar con esta presentación. Gracias por venir. Y bueno, antes de comenzar, me permito atender a las normas de la universidad en materia de contingencias. Les pido a todas y todos los asistentes que, en caso de alguna emergencia que nos obligue a evacuar el auditorio, se dirijan sin correr, sin gritar y sin empujar, las salidas de emergencia se encuentran detrás de ustedes y a mi lado derecho. Los puntos de reunión se encuentran en el jardín frente a este edificio y frente a la cafetería central. Se les solicita además tener especial cuidado con los niños y personas con alguna discapacidad. Cualquier apoyo pueden acudir con el personal del ITESO de Servicios Generales, a quienes les agradezco muchísimo, como siempre, su participación y su trabajo para que nos podamos ver y nos podamos escuchar con calma. Eh, yo soy Enrique Páez Agrás, soy el director del Departamento de Estudios Socioculturales y les doy de la bienvenida a ustedes y también a quienes nos siguen a la distancia. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Dr. Rogers. Be welcome to ITESO. I will now read your resume, which I know you quite uh, know perfectly, so I will read it in Spanish. <laughs> Bueno, le doy la bienvenida al doctor Rogers, eh, que es profesor de Nuevos Medios y Cultura Digital en Estudios sobre Medios de la Universidad de Ámsterdam, donde también dirige el Digital Methods Initiative, un grupo que desarrolla software y técnicas para estudiar plataformas en línea. Es autor de dos libros premiados, Information Politics, On the Web y Digital Methods, justamente el que presentamos el día de hoy. Ambos publicados por MIT Press, así como Doing Digital Methods, publicado por Sage. Rogers fue coeditor junto con Sabine Niedrer, espero que eso se pronuncie de ese modo, de The Politics of Social Media Manipulations y editor de The Propagation of Misinformation on Social Media, ambos publicados por Amsterdam University Press. A mí me da particular gusto recibir a esta publicación y, por supuesto, al doctor Rogers, puesto que eh, la jornada para que ustedes tengan hoy ese libro en las manos ha sido particularmente larga. Ustedes saben que el trabajo de traducción de este tipo de nuevos lenguajes no tiene, eh, tiene perdón, algunas, algunas particularidades. Y presento, además de a nuestro invitado especial, el doctor Rogers, presento a mis colegas del Departamento de Estudios Socioculturales y miembros también de Signalab, que ha sido el intermediario para esta edición, el director creativo, maestro Víctor Hugo Ábrego. Muchas gracias, maestro. Ah, por supuesto, a la licenciada Paloma López Portillo Vázquez. También profesora del departamento y también miembro del equipo de Signalab en metodologías y análisis. Y, por supuesto, a nuestro genio tecnólogo, ¿cómo se llama tú? Diego Arredondo, perdón, licenciado Diego Arredondo. <risa> profesor del Departamento de Estudios Socioculturales y también miembro de Signalab. Sin más, maestros, doctor, muchas gracias por su presencia. Buenas tardes. Bueno, muchas gracias Enrique y muchas gracias a todas y a todos por acompañarnos. Es un, eh, para nosotros un lujo y un tremendísimo honor tener al profesor Rogers en esta presentación, que como ya bien dijo Enrique, fue eh, una jornada larga, pero también muy esperada por todo el equipo. Eh, es un libro que es un, eh, pues es un ícono, ¿no? es un mito en, la, en los estudios digitales en general, en los estudios de comunicación digital. Eh, así que estamos muy, muy emocionados por por fin eh, poder estar aquí. Entonces, bueno, para no tomar mucho del tiempo que está más bien destinado a escuchar al profesor Rogers, eh, leeremos eh, cada quien un texto muy breve para después cederle la palabra al doctor y al final también abriremos eh, un pequeño espacio para que haya algún intercambio con, con quienes están amablemente aquí con nosotros. Y también les recuerdo que el día de mañana... El, el doctor Rogers impartirá en este mismo auditorio una conferencia, ahí ya digamos como para profundizar más de lo que empezaremos a discutir el día de hoy, a las 11 de la mañana. Entonces, mañana de 11 a 1, o bueno, 12 y media, algo así, este, nos esperamos aquí. Entonces, bueno, eh, voy a leer esto eh, 
tan claro y rápido como pueda. Eh, bueno, la era digital ha potenciado y ampliado la construcción de objetos de investigación alrededor del mundo. La emergencia de plataformas digitales, motores de búsqueda y decenas de apps ha traído a la par una oleada también amplia de usos y apropiaciones que millones de personas han hecho de estos espacios virtuales. Al mismo tiempo, en el último par de décadas han emergido monopolios globales y nuevos referentes de control y vigilancia gubernamentales y privados desde el frente digital del mundo. La investigación de estos complejos panoramas de interacción social hoy en día no se puede pensar sin aportaciones clave desarrolladas por el profesor Richard Rogers y por la Digital Methods Initiative. La observación de tensiones geopolíticas a través de la disputa de encuadres sobre distintos temas en Wikipedia, la utilización de resultados de búsquedas en Google como una máquina epistemológica para comprender tanto las tendencias sociales alrededor de un tema como los entramados comerciales que condicionan a su algoritmo y con ello la mirada de quienes lo utilizamos en el día a día, o la explicación de YouTube como escenario de emergencia y consolidación de identidades alrededor de cualquier tipo de contenido, eh, <coughs> perdón, este, alrededor de cualquier tipo de contenido, o como espacio de circulación de propaganda digital o de análisis de formas de apropiación de contenidos específicos conteni eh, consumidos durante periodos determinados de tiempo en idiomas particulares, son solo algunos ejemplos generales de las muchísimas posibilidades de investigación que los métodos digitales han contribuido a tener a la mano hoy en día. La educación y la investigación tienen el reto de analizar y comprender las condiciones sociodigitales que configuran nuestras sociedades, es decir, la aceleración, plataformización, viralización y algoritmización de la realidad, eh, sus implicaciones en las formas de relación entre las personas, en los procesos de subjetivación y en la producción de conocimiento. Por ello, el desarrollo de marcos teóricos y propuestas metodológicas que parten de, están enfocadas en o confluyen en lo digital, es cada vez más necesario en nuestros días. Los cruces entre herramientas de descarga, gestión y visualización de datos con conceptos y metodologías provenientes de las ciencias sociales y las humanidades se hacen cada vez más pertinentes en nuestras aulas y en nuestros espacios de investigación. La versión en español de Digital Methods, pone al alcance de más personas posibilidades asequibles de acercarse a la exploración, comprensión y estudio de lo sociodigital desde marcos interpretativos anclados al pensamiento crítico, a la investigación que mezcla lo cuantitativo con lo cualitativo y al contexto sociocultural como elemento fundamental para comprender el desarrollo tecnológico en la era contemporánea. Desde que nació en 2016, Signal Lab ha seguido la pista al trabajo del profesor Rogers y a la Digital Methods Initiative. A lo largo de este tiempo hemos trabajado con algunas de sus herramientas para Facebook, Google, YouTube y para el análisis de textos, para analizar procesos electorales, movimientos sociales y tensiones socioculturales alrededor de temas como la migración, el género o las estrategias de influencia en plataformas sociodigitales. También hemos compartido con estudiantes y profesores lo que hemos aprendido a hacer con estas herramientas. Asimismo, hemos desarrollado conceptos y metodologías situadas en contextos tan complejos como el mexicano y el latinoamericano a partir de estas y otras herramientas. Por eso recibimos con mucha gratitud y alegría al profesor Rogers, a quien estamos ansiosos de escuchar y con quien esperamos iniciar un diálogo que vaya más allá de esta visita. Gracias y bienvenido. Muchas gracias, Víctor. Yo voy a continuar. En esta misma línea, los métodos digitales para la investigación social nos ayudan a replantear el uso de las tecnologías y los métodos de enseñanza para la creación de proyectos y la generación de conocimiento a partir del trabajo interdisciplinario. En el libro se señala la diferencia entre los métodos digitales y los métodos virtuales, es decir, entre el contenido nativo digital y el contenido que es digitalizado o bien entre los objetos, contenidos, dispositivos y entornos que nacen en los nuevos medios y los que han migrado a ellos. Si la función de los métodos virtuales es digitalizar técnicas de investigación ya existentes y trasladarlas a la web o adaptarlas al medio, entonces los métodos digitales son el medio para la investigación. Es decir, a través de los métodos digitales podemos hacer investigación social con herramientas y con los datos que se crean en Internet, especialmente en las interacciones entre las personas. Nos interesa el análisis de la experiencia social, de la experiencia social convertida en datos digitales, porque percibimos nuestra realidad tanto on como offline, donde la división entre lo real y lo virtual ya no existe, hay un continuum. El Internet pasa a ser el objeto de estudio para convertirse en la fuente de datos. El trabajo con grandes volúmenes de datos también implica pensar junto con los métodos. 
Porque no se trata solamente de saber qué herramientas usar o cómo utilizarlas, sino en plantear cuidadosamente las preguntas que queremos responder sobre un tema en específico. ¿Cómo hacemos hablar a los datos? ¿Cómo podemos conversar con ellos? Uno de los retos de la investigación en la era digital es la toma de decisiones respecto a los datos. Desde la adquisición, el minado, el filtrado y la representación, nosotros tenemos una gran responsabilidad en cada uno de esos pasos, porque así es como hacemos a los datos hablar. Con los métodos digitales podemos innovar en las formas de visualización y diseño de información para encontrar rutas cada vez mejores para contar historias con datos. Como hemos planteado en el trabajo en el laboratorio, es la importancia de pensar en el dato anclado a contextos, cuerpos, relatos, situaciones y hacer hablar a los datos a través de metodologías multicapa que coloquen a las personas al centro del análisis. No solo se trata de los modos de representación de los datos a través de las visualizaciones, sino de los modos de representación de las interacciones de las personas en diferentes plataformas digitales. Queremos alejarnos del uso indiscriminado de datos personales por parte de algunas empresas y gobiernos y pensar en estrategias para abordar, narrar y visibilizar problemáticas sociales desde el respeto y la dignidad. Las visualizaciones nos ayudan a contar historias, pero también son herramientas de indagación. Los métodos digitales son una vía para identificar el contenido que se antepone a otro por motores de búsqueda, recomendaciones y algoritmos. En muchos casos, la investigación de lo digital comienza con la, con la visualización para hacer un mapeo basado en datos. Los grafos, las nubes de palabras, los mapas, las redes, los bigramas, etc. Permiten la exploración de lo que los datos no muestran a simple vista. Nosotros como investigadores convertimos los datos en información. De ahí la importancia del trabajo interdisciplinario, de plantear las preguntas, elegir las herramientas y también narrar y presentar las historias desde diferentes aproximaciones de la ciencia de redes, ciencia de datos y las ciencias sociales. La convergencia entre las ciencias computacionales y las humanidades para crear un nuevo lenguaje visual y un diseño de información que pase, como dice en el libro, a transformar la tinta en bits. Gracias, eh, Paloma. Voy a eh, continuar con un, una última reflexión. Eh, desde el laboratorio y los espacios de docencia que tenemos en el Departamento de Estudios Socioculturales, eh, en ambos casos, eh, de la mano del trabajo de estudiantes, hemos ido aprendiendo, practicando, perfeccionando cómo hacer preguntas a los datos, eh, sobre todo aquellos que pueden extraerse de diversas fuentes y plataformas en la web. Eh, se suele decir que el dato está en el relato y tiene algo de cierto esta expresión, pero nos gusta pensar que un paso antes está la pregunta, ¿no? y en la pregunta está la ruta. Eh, la pregunta antecede la elección de datos o de herramientas para su análisis o visualización, porque empezar por la pregunta nos obliga, nos orienta a pensar en el contexto, no, a no sacarle la vuelta al contexto. Eh, nos lleva a eh, entender que podemos hacer una observación situada y crítica, que no busca... Eh, que los datos eh, sean simples fuentes de validación o que hablen por sí mismos. Eh, como comentaba Paloma, hay que entender cómo puede, podemos encontrar en ellos algo que tienen que decirnos, ¿no? cómo hacerlos hablar, y de nuevo, no, no por su cuenta propia. Y eh, algo interesante es que nos puede llevar a nuevas oportunidades para hacer nuevas preguntas. Es decir, eh, muchas veces los hallazgos están en encontrar cuál es el siguiente punto de indagación y nos permite esto seguir profundizando, categorizando la información con un reconocimiento claro y consciente de las potencialidades, limitaciones, sesgos y dinámicas de poder que pueda haber detrás del registro de cualquier conjunto de datos. Eh, en la formulación de las preguntas, de nuevo, insistiendo en, en la importancia de esto, se ancla una enorme parte de la relevancia de los métodos digitales, más allá de lo, de lo impresionantes y, y eh, estimulantes y potentes que puedan ser eh, distintas técnicas para trabajar y visualizar eh, datos, eh, algo muy importante eh, que plantea el profesor Rogers en su libro es que al hablar de métodos digitales no solo estamos hablando de cómo estudiar internet o la cultura digital en sí misma, sino cómo a través de datos que están fundamentados en internet o, que, o, o contenidos, objetos digitales que obtenemos de internet, podemos estudiar la sociedad y la cultura en términos mucho más amplios y en formas que antes probablemente hubieran sido imposibles. Dada la complejidad y la inestabilidad de la misma naturaleza de los medios y objetos digitales, eh, hemos aprendido a procurar acercarnos a, a estas preguntas desde una mente flexible, abierta, que sepa identificar en cada momento, en cada caso, los mejores métodos eh, eh, y los caminos más adecuados para abordar objetos y medios digitales que, como plantea el profesor Rogers en su libro, están en una constante reconfiguración. 
más allá, por lo tanto, de recetas, instructivos, tutoriales o caminos lineales, lo que hemos aprendido es a apostar por aproximaciones que aprenden de la iteración, de la prueba y del error, de una indagación recursiva, donde de nuevo una pista nos lleva a la otra, una pregunta nos abre una nueva, y por la multiplicidad de abordajes que, pueden tener este, eh, que se pueden tener ante este tipo de fenómenos, ya que en sí mismos ya son multidimensionales y multicapa. Es decir, hemos aprendido a reconocer como hallazgos eh, el encontrar nuevas preguntas, ¿no? las nuevas preguntas como hallazgos en sí mismos. También a encontrar nuevas oportunidades de, de adquisición y exploración de datos como un hallazgo en sí mismo, ¿no? algo que tal vez no habíamos pensado antes, e incluso vacíos de información o sesgos de la información como hallazgos y descubrimientos relevantes en sí mismos. Como un departamento anclado en las ciencias sociales y en su vinculación hacia el trabajo interdisciplinario, hemos encontrado no solo el valor que puede aportar una mirada crítica y de indagación cualitativa para entender mejor los efectos de la tecnología a través de la aplicación de métodos digitales, sino también, como subraya el mismo profesor Rogers en el libro, eh, cómo los métodos digitales nos pueden ayudar a fundamentar preguntas que son relevantes para comprender mejor la misma sociedad en la que vivimos, los cambios culturales que estamos atravesando y cómo puede eh, de alguna forma reconocerse la humanidad como la conocemos hoy en lo que se alcanza a entretejer, reflejar, imprimir en la información que a diario se registra en internet y que es susceptible, por lo tanto, de extraerse, analizarse, medirse, categorizarse como colecciones de eh, objetos digitales. El trabajo de, con métodos digitales y herramientas basadas en ciencia de datos, ciencia de redes, desde una perspectiva crítica como la que apostamos en este departamento, eh, reconoce que los datos, de nuevo, no van a hablar por sí mismos ni son neutrales. Eh, tanto en el trabajo en laboratorio como en el desarrollo de proyectos semestrales, en, cursos con, en, en los cursos con estudiantes, eh, hemos cubierto una enorme variedad de temas y fuentes de información. Estos pasan desde, por supuesto, los que tienen que ver con datos facilitados por plataformas eh, y redes sociodigitales, desde sus propias interfaces de desarrollo, como son las, las APIs por sus siglas en inglés, que son, como decía Paloma hace un momento, objetos eh, en su esencia nativamente digitales. Aquí entran datos muchos eh, fuentes de datos, muchas de ellas a las que hemos podido acceder gracias al trabajo de las herramientas que eh, desarrolla y, 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 eh, y recopila Digital Methods Initiative, como datos de Twitter, de YouTube, Instagram, Wikipedia, eh, Spotify, eh, Facebook y Google, entre otros. Eh, pero también trabajamos y aprendemos cómo, seguimos aprendiendo cómo aplicar fuente, eh, métodos digitales a fuentes de datos que no necesariamente son nativamente digitales, que son más bien objetos digitalizados, como es el caso de bases de datos aplicadas y publicadas por gobiernos e instituciones, como datos abiertos, eh, retomar textos o audios que devienen en texto gracias a eh, herramientas de transcripción automática o reconocimiento de caracteres, o por sus siglas en inglés OCR, eh, levantamientos propios con formularios digitales y conjuntos de datos de de, de, que recopilan mismas organizaciones de sociedad civil, cole, eh, colectivos, u otros espacios académicos. Eh, algo importante que apunta Richard Rogers es que en, en su libro es que, en, y algo que hemos atestiguado en el trabajo de laboratorio, en el trabajo de, de, eh, en cursos es, con estudiantes, es que no necesariamente tiene que ser, eh, no tienen que ser eh, conjuntos masivos para ser relevantes. Ante un, un paradigma basado en, eh, en entender que solo los datos masivos son los que nos van a poder llevar a, a entender eh, fenómenos complejos o realidades complejas, eh, hemos encontrado que en el detalle, en el análisis, en el análisis cualitativo, se puede llegar a, a hallazgos sumamente relevantes, no, si la pregunta está bien perfilada desde un inicio. Eh, en la mayoría de estos casos, las herramientas y orientaciones eh, dadas por Digital Methods Initiative han sido fundamentales. Eh, solo pensar en la cantidad de filas de datos tabulares, filas en Excel, que se han descargado simplemente YouTube Data Tools en esta universidad, tanto por quienes investigan como quienes estudian en el ITESO, ya podría ser una cantidad apabullante. Además de un sinfín de herramientas que hemos aprovechado, como Spotify Artist Network, Text Analysis, Wikipedia Edit Scrapper, Google Lip Mania Device, Instagram Scraper y las eh, ya... ya eh, pues cerradas por las políticas de las plataformas, porque en su momento fueron bastante relevantes, eh, Instagram Scraper y NetBeast de Facebook, que en su momento nos dieron una puerta accesible eh, para un análisis eh, desde, una, desde el pensamiento crítico y desde este énfasis cualitativo. Eh, como laboratorio de, y, y una, eh, Signal Lab, y como una escuela de comunicación eh, profundamente inspirada en el pensamiento de eh, Bruno Latour, de la teoría del actor Red, y el estudio de los movimientos sociales y fenómenos culturales emergentes, hemos aprendido también el enorme énfasis de poner 
perdón, el enorme valor de poner el énfasis de nuestras preguntas en las relaciones entre objetos, ya sean estos objetos eh, actores, como cuentas, eh, eh, hashtags, tópicos anotados por sistemas eh, humanos o no humanos, eh, URLs, palabras, videos, canales, artistas, es decir, en entender que en las relaciones está eh, mucha de la observación que podemos en, encontrar como más relevante y que nos permite dibujar, entender, aproximarnos a un ecosistema de información complejo, entender los actores, interacciones e influencias que están eh, eh, ejerciéndose sobre el mismo, eh, identificar los hashtags como consignas digitales, como discursos que están en disputa tratando de plantear una interpretación por encima de otra o que de alguna forma eh, en, consolida nuevas formas de subjetivar eh, eh, la interpretación de los hechos o, o de los conflictos o de lo que nos atraviesa y eh, entre muchas otras configuraciones eh, que permiten las herramientas que hemos aprovechado y que hemos aprendido de Detail Methods Initiative, eh, también poder rastrear las relaciones algorítmicas ¿no? ante el escenario de cajas eh, negras, en muchos casos de estas plataformas, ¿no? como es el caso de YouTube, eh, herramientas como YouTube Data Tools desarrollada en Detail Methods eh, eh, Initiative nos permiten hacer estos ejercicios de ingeniería inversa y si bien no es el reto necesariamente descifrar el algoritmo y, y saber qué está exactamente ahí programado, sí podemos medir y sí podemos caracterizar y visibilizar sus efectos, ¿no? podemos ver quiénes están eh, logrando mayor visibilidad, qué temas están relacionados a otros y qué nos dice eso sobre nuestros hábitos de consumo y sobre lo que las personas están eh, eh, en, en, y los sistemas que, que consumen están asociando en términos de objetos digitales. Eh, es eh, de verdad un, un honor tener al profesor Rogers aquí y eh, concluyo diciendo que pues, el tener este libro eh, pues es un paso más en seguir documentando pues, un campo que sigue siendo emergente, por más que eh, Digital Methods Initiative ya lleva bastantitos años, si no me equivoco, desde 2007. Eh, el tener la oportunidad de tener este libro y el, también en el trabajo que hacemos en el laboratorio y en los cursos, procurar que la producción que tengamos esté siendo visibilizada y pensada para la web y desde la web, eh, pues de alguna forma también es un aprendizaje de lo que nos ha comentado en su libro eh, el doctor Rogers, que es un medio en constante reconfiguración y un medio que eh, pues podemos aprovechar eh, para estudiarlo y también para consolidar ahí eh, lo que vayamos aprendiendo eh, sobre el mismo. Entonces, pues sin más, muchas gracias. Le paso la palabra al doctor Rogers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for the kind and very thorough introduction. Uh, appreciate that. Um, the title, uh, as you can see, is, is, is Digital Methods. And what I'm going to do uh, in, the, in the next uh, few minutes is talk about three things. Uh, first, what I want to do is talk about digital methods historically. So. Where are we in the study of the internet, the study of online data? That's the first thing I'm going to talk about. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to situate digital methods epistemologically. Um, so how are digital methods similar to and different from the digital humanities generally, as well as the computational social sciences? I will argue that digital methods uh, is, is, is distinctive from the two of them uh, because of the way it treats method and the way it treats data. And then finally, I'm going to show you some of the ways to do digital methods practically. Uh, and I'll talk about them practically um, in connection with the study of contemporary events. Uh, so those are the, those are the three things. Um, okay, just to start, Uh, so, I, I, I situate the, the study of the internet beginning in 1994 with, with the first web browser. This was the period of cyberspace, and cyberspace is a special idea. Uh, it's the only medium um, compared to television, radio, etc., where the concept itself comes from literature. It actually comes from science fiction. So cyberspace as an idea was, a, was of a space apart, something distinctive from the real. Um, 
And this was a particular idea where you would, where you would study it as an imaginary and you would project all kinds of ideas about what we thought that the internet would do for us. It will improve democracy. It will improve the bodily. It will improve our identities. These sorts of ideas. However, around, I think, I mean, I put it at about um, 1998 uh, uh, or so, um, the social scientists arrived. Uh, and the, what the social scientists did was they, instead of imagining what the internet was about, they went and studied it in situ. They went to internet cafes, um, and they invented terms like the digital divide. So it was the internet was not experienced the same by all cultures. It was, in fact, quite different. Um, so they actually also changed the method. So in order to study the internet, you had to go offline. You had to interview. You had to observe. Uh, and this was, this was the time where uh, the social sciences, the whole social scientific instrumentarium was put onto the internet. Now, something happened a lot more recently. I dated it about 2007, 2008, where suddenly um, the, what I call the, the web as data turn arrived. The web was not only thought of as this space apart or as something that needed to be grounded, um, but rather something as a data set that you could study in order to find out what was happening in society and in culture. Suddenly the web was thought of as being reflective of what was going on. And so this is where the Digital Methods Project began, as a, as a project to, to take the web as data and to understand what was happening not only on the internet, not only on digi in digital culture, but rather in society and culture at large. Now, most recently, a new, a new term has arrived uh, called the post-digital, and it's a very interesting term. Um, it means two things. Uh, one is that um, the digital isn't special anymore. We don't need the term digital methods. It's just methods. And so the digital is suddenly, according to the post-digital, it's not anything special anymore because we all use them. Digital methods have become normalized, have, have mainstreamed. So this is the first idea. But the second one is also important. And that is that we are having increasing troubles actually extracting data from social media platforms. So we need to think about new ways of studying the online without relying on the corporate hegemonies, without relying on the monopolies, without relying on the APIs being shut down. So this is also what the post-digital refers to. So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about what digital methods are, just give you an example really quickly. So what you see here is a map of the US um, and then the states are colored differently. They're colored differently according to the incidence of a search for a recipe or a dish. Uh, just before the national feast in the US, Thanksgiving. So the states that are colored purple have searched for sweet potato pie far more often than the states that are in light orange. So what you see is you're using web data, search, search terms, and this is from searches on a site called allrecipes.com, in order to begin to understand taste and preference. So here's just one recipe, here's another one, macaroni and cheese, another one, sweet potato. Then the distribution of taste changes quite dramatically. Corn casserole, you see, Corn belt, green beans, another different location, turkey brine, something in the north, yams in the west. So you see a quite a sort of distribution of taste or geography of taste on the basis of web data. Um, now, th these are trends. Um, you can also ask the question of how else you would do this research. Um, 
I mean, you could do it uh, with surveys, you could do it with... Um, but you could also do it by looking at Instagram photos and geolocating uh, where um, these particular dishes are being served on a particular day. And this particular idea of using the web as a way to ground what's happening in society and culture is one of the terms that was introduced in this book. We call it online groundedness. The idea that you can ground your findings or um, establish or validate your findings about what's happening in society and culture by looking at other online data. So this is a radical proposal, um, and, and, and it's one that is, is not always welcomed uh, to, to use online data um, to ground findings about what's happening in society that you found originally using online data. But nevertheless, um, it's something that you can explore. <clears throat> now, these are trends. This is specificity. So these are the recipes that were most uh, looked after or sought uh, in particular states. Um, so you can see trends, and you can study specificity or specific um, taste, distinctive from other places of taste. So this you could you could call this you could call these maps the places of taste or preference. <clears throat> now, how did this come about? How did these ideas come about? Well, this this web as data turn, um, as I said, uh, occurred. Uh, 2007, 2008, some of the key texts um, around this time uh, were the one by Duncan Watts, which is referenced here, another one by David Lazare and others who coined this notion of a computational social science. Um, so this was the, 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 one of the first times where people thought, well, we could study what's happening in society and culture using web data. However, there's a warning, um, and this warning came uh, from the what you could call web data or even big data's flagship project, and that was Google Flu Trends. I don't know if you've heard of Google Flu Trends. It was very, very interesting. Um, what Google Flu Trends was was, um, uh, was a project by Google.org. This is the nonprofit part of Google, where they took people's searches for flu and flu-like symptoms, coughing, sneezing, and then they geolocated where those searches were coming from in order to chart the incidence of flu. So it was actually quite groundbreaking because they were able to find where flu was taking place before uh, traditional uh, means. And, and so the web became this anticipatory medium. Uh, however, what happened in 2012, 2013, suddenly was that Google Flu Trends was overcompensating, uh, was, was, uh, come, was saying that flu was twice as prevalent as it actually was. Why? Um, well, there are a couple of reasons, uh, perhaps. So first was a speculative reason. Perhaps when f the flu season arrives and people start talking about flu amongst one another or on television, then you start searching for it, right? So media effects. Media is affecting what we're searching for. But more recently it was figured out that auto-suggest Google auto-suggest, when you begin typing something and then you see a, a suggestion of how to complete your search, um, interfered with, with, uh, with using, with, with the search uh, queries themselves. The warning is, is that uh, online data um, does not always, is not always reflective of what's happening in the wild. It might be reflective of what's happening in media. And you always have to therefore study symmetrically, this is the argument, symmetrically uh, the, the web as data uh, for studying society and web data as a product of the platform, algorithmic effects. 
Okay. <clears throat> now, what I want to do is I want to situate digital methods uh, in, um, compare them to digital humanities and, and the computational social sciences more broadly, and, and, and talk to you about the subtle differences. <clears throat> I put up this matrix, I don't know if you've seen it before, um, in order to talk about how to um, place particular kinds of approaches to the digital, to the study of the digital. So this is, I'm, I'm kind of summing up very, very broadly digital studies. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm talking about types of method and types of data. So you can have data that was born online, or you can have data that was digitized and migrated online, right? You can similarly have method which was migrated online. You see them all the time, it's online surveys, etc. Or you can have method that in some ways was written for the medium. Um, so we can, we can situate most every, I mean it's, I find, I think so, but we can also argue about it, um, a lot of different approaches to digital studies in this, in this, uh, in this, in this sort of matrix. Um, and I want to talk about a couple of uh, approaches in the digital humanities and a couple of approaches in, in the computational social sciences. So the digital humanities, and these are some of my favorite ones, this is why I chose them. Um, I want to talk about uh, cultural analytics. Uh, you've probably heard of it. It's by uh, Lev Manovich. Uh, and uh, what Lev Manovich does is he uses uh, digitized data. Right? Um, so uh, the covers of all the covers of Time magazine or all the paintings of Rothko. Um, and then he um, uh, uses a technique using a piece of software like this. This is image sorter, where you group images according to similarities. So this is, these are images are grouped according to hue or color. And what he calls this is a style space, uh, a style space. And so you study a style space by looking at how styles have changed over time. Um, so you see, if this, is this is the covers of Time magazine. So you see at some point uh, there is a break and, and at some, another point there's another break in style. So what he argues, and this is very interesting uh, for uh, everyone who, who does both, quali well, particularly qualitative work, is that we no longer, with a big data approach, we no longer need to periodize uh, because we, 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 see the peri but the, we see the history is continuous. So we don't have to have separate periods. We can have continuous description. So this is the... The idea. We also don't need to ca uh, to, car uh, to categorize anymore. We don't need special categories uh, because it, because we can see continuous change. So this is this is this is, the, this is the, the argument in digital humanities for a big data approach. This is another project. Um, this is using uh, Instagram selfies. So when the Instagram API was still working. So this is back. I think this project was done in 2016. Um, <clears throat> what he did is he. Um, queried the hashtag selfie uh, and the geo coordinates of five cities worldwide, got back the pictures of selfies, and then did formal analysis of the, of the poses in order to determine the moods of places. So he studied the selfies from Berlin, the selfies from Moscow, the selfies from Rio, uh, the selfies from uh, New York, etc. Uh, and what he found was that uh, Moscow was quite glum and Rio was quite jubilant. The second digital humanities approach is called culturomics. Culturomics. <clears throat> Again, they used digitized data. Um, so what they do is they use the Google Ngram, which is, the, which is a collection of Google books, and they make graphs like this. So, the, the, the Google Ngram viewer allows you to query keywords and see where they have been mentioned in books 
this is in English, but it, there are also um, Ngram viewers available in other languages, in, in, including Spanish. The, 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 the best collection is English. However, the Spanish one is good, the German one is good, the French one is good. Um, and then you can see interest, c cultural interest over time um, and, and the rise and the fall thereof. Now, there are a couple of, couple of uh, projects that Culturomics does that, that I find quite interesting. One of them, I'll just mention briefly, is the idea of celebrity. Um, celebrity used to be a very long periods of time where someone was famous, and now these periods of time are becoming shorter and shorter. Okay, so <clears throat> as you've seen, a lot of the digital humanities projects work with digitized data. Um, they also work with, arguably work also with uh, digitized uh, uh, method. Um, now I wanna move to the computational social sciences and I wanna give you two examples. These are largely from scientometrics, bibliometrics, um, the study of reputation. Uh, largely, although there are many, many other computational social scientific uh, traditions. Now, I want to talk about first webometrics. This particular image comes from the issue crawler. This is software that I built some years ago, uh, where um, you take a set, of, uh, a set of URLs and then you find the links between them. Um, and, and what you ultimately find is who links to whom. And you'll notice that um, it, it, it gives you a sort of um, a, a reputational profile. Certain websites get more links, other websites get fewer links. Websites that get a lot of links from websites that get a lot of links are the ones with the highest reputation. This is also how Google PageRank works. The second one is altmetrics. Uh, altmetrics is a a, a way of studying the reputation of academic articles um, on the basis of <clears throat> their mentions in social media, how often they've been tweeted, but also how often they've, they've appeared in, uh, in online bibliographies, etc. I don't know if you've ever seen this sort of um, funny shaped, uh, this, this multicolored donut. Um, so this is, so what's interesting about this particular approach is that uses um, sort of digitized method, but it uses natively digital data. Now, you, you see it already, um, how digital methods are different. So digital methods uh, use natively digital data and also natively digital method. So method written for the medium. Uh, so born digital data and, and born digital um, method. Now, this notion of natively digital is oftentimes confused. Um, people think it comes from ethnography or anthropology. It does not. Uh, so I'm not talking about um, digital natives, right? I'm talking about the natively digital, uh, which means um, that it's, it's, it's something that has been written for the medium. Uh, it's something that, that you, you hear... Um, uh, uh, like native ads or, or native apps or something that's, that's written for a particular platform or written for a particular uh, processor and this, this is where it comes from originally. So it's written for the medium. Now I want to uh, differentiate between the natively digital methods and digitized methods. Right? So all of the methods that have been and, the, and there's a lot of work that been, that's been going on and, and, uh, and uh, the, there's a lot of improvements, <clears throat> but there's a lot of unknowns uh, for these particular kinds of... So for online surveys originally, and even, even increasingly today, the question is, well, what's a good response rate? What's the population? These things are hard to know oftentimes if, they, if they're just released. Um, so what I want to try to contrast here, or what I want to try to think through, is what are natively digital uh, methods? And this is the idea of digital methods. This is where it came from. And it has a particular kind of process to it. Um, it looks for research opportunities uh, that platforms have. It, it, it asks what, do, what kind of research affordances do platforms uh, have? 
Um, and there's a process to it. You, what you ask is, well, what, what kind of objects are available on the platform? Um, so on Wikipedia, there, there, you know, there, there are edits, there are edit histories. Um, so and and you know, in uh, on Facebook and, and increasingly on on most other social media platforms, you know, there are likes, uh, there are followers. Okay, so what can you do with this? Uh, what can you actually do with these natively digital objects? You can also learn from the platforms and from the engines themselves. How do they handle them? How does, how does uh, Google handle the link? How does Google handle the click? How does Google handle freshness? What can we, what can we learn from that? Can we, and then this is the key thought. How can we repurpose the methods of the medium in order to do social and cultural research? So this is the digital methods philosophy, if you will. And as I said before, um, the, how to make findings and how to ground your findings. And, and are there opportunities to ground your findings in the online? And this is where this notion of online groundedness has come from. So can we, I mean, it's, it sounds crazy to some, you know, everyone thinks, well, surely we need to go offline in order to make findings about what's happening. You know? But actually, if we treat the web quite seriously as a, as a data source for, uh, as, as partially, uh, or in some cases less than partially, even uh, more uh, greatly so, as reflective of what's happening in society and in culture, then we can make findings of what's happening there based on, on, on web data and thereby grounded in the online. Okay, so what I want to do um, in the time remaining uh, is talk about digital methods uh, practically. Um, and what, what, are, what, are some, what are some digital methods? Um, and what I want to do is talk about this, this using digital methods to study contemporary events in particular. Um, so before I do that, uh, what I just want to show you um, are some of the digital methods of in, the, in, the, in the book, um, just so you've seen them, but also uh, in subsequent uh, work um, that we've done, where you see uh, what what you can study. So <clears throat> um, here are some of them. Um, and I'll talk about YouTube more in a, in a minute. Um, this is more, more recent. Uh, Facebook studies, Twitter studies, Instagram studies. Not only individual platform or single platform studies, but cross platform is very important. And then how do you actually do that? Um, because not all, you can't necessarily take the same digital object that appears on all the platforms and just and just think that you can that it, that it acts the same on all of them. No, platforms have vernaculars, right? They have individual cultures, and you have to take those into account. So, how do you make the study of the same digital object across the platforms commensurable? How do you take into account a, a platform? specific pla platform vernaculars. Uh, most recently, TikTok. Um, and also, um, digital methods has moved into data journalism uh, and also open source intelligence. Um, so these are new areas for digital methods and, and, uh, and then the combinations of the two. So I won't talk about that now, but know that it's available to you. Okay, so... <clears throat> I'm going to talk about, um, I think, three of these platforms, if, if I have time, or if I don't, maybe two. Uh, so I want to, I want to talk about um, Facebook, um, Twitter, uh, and perhaps Instagram. Uh, I'll save YouTube and, and TikTok uh, for another, another time. Um, what I want to emphasize, however, is that it's important to also historicize these platforms. They change. Um, and, it's, it, and they change not only in their culture, they change not only in what is considered dominant objects of study on them, but also the data that's available. And it's this combination that you, 
I would advise that one takes into account when thinking about these, these platforms. So that's how I'm going to present them to you, as, also as historical objects, with changing objects of study and changing um, data available. OK, <clears throat> so Facebook. So I think, I mean, the early Facebook, I just want to immediately go to this picture. Um, so this is the Facebook. Um, this is 2004. I don't know if you saw um, the movie, the, the Social Network. If you did, you're familiar with his character. Um, he was one of the um, co-founders, or at least early investors. Um, and he was the one in the movie who said to Mark Zuckerberg, the Facebook is lame. It's just Facebook, right? So this was the moment in the movie. Um, so if you look at this, this is, the, this is one, of the, one of the earliest ones. You'll notice a number of things. But what you notice, I think, um, is that, first of all, it was, it was, it was a kind of college software, right? Um, and, 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 and sort of quite, you know, elite college software, but it, but it was something where you, where you presented yourself. Um, and so it's not, it's not unusual um, that one would begin to study Facebook in, in the style of the presentation of self, of, of Goffman, of this idea of the front stage. Um, also, the other thing you'll notice um, is there are, um, um, well, there are, there, are, there are interests and there are friends. You can't see so many friends here. Um, but nevertheless, the, the idea of the combination of interests on the one hand and friends on the other, this is classic social network analysis data. Who's friends with whom? And do those who are friends with the same people share the same interests? Are they clicks? Right? Um, so this is classic, and so this is the the, the original um, uh, way of of studying of studying Facebook. Um, so now, in the digital methods tradition, what we did um, was we took the interests of politicians. So we so we, we we thought, well, how do we how do we make this interesting? How do we repurpose this data for social and cultural research? So what we did <clears throat> is we made this piece of software. Um, it, was a, it was actually a, more of an art project. It was called El Frendo. Um, but what it was, was it was um, uh, the friends, this was back in the day, the friends of Obama and the friends of McCain, they were, they were, the, in the, uh, they were competing against each other in the presidential campaign. And what are their interests? The friends of the Democrat, the friends of the right, what are their interests? And are they compatible? So to what extent can we read? The, so this is before the, we started talking about the culture wars. Um, so to what extent can we read the culture wars? Or can we actually see compatibilities um, between? So can we see commonalities? So we also did this. Um, um, so, so interests can also have related interests. So if you are interested in chess, what else would you be interested in? So th these are the sorts of things. This is, this is, we call this, this is a term, and it's also a chapter in the book. We call this post-demographics. So we're not studying people's preferences or their voting preferences on the basis of income, age, um, you know, geography, right? but rather on the basis of these preferences which you can see there. Now, something happened. Uh, this is, I think, 2010. I, I call it the beginning of the ethics turn. Um, there are other people who mark the ethics turn uh, differently than, than this. But nevertheless, um, the, a researcher, colleague of ours, um, actually was able, to, there was a study that was put out uh, by some researchers that, that did social network analysis, tastes and ties, as it's called. So, so your interests and your friends, and do they match? 
But what he was able to do is he, he was able to de-anonymize um, the friends uh, on the basis of the data. And he, and he said, you know, um, we, we have a problem. Social media research has a problem. It has an ethics problem. So what happened around this time is that Facebook also changed its API. So you could no longer do, you could no longer do that research. You can no longer do social network research, friends and their preferences. It was over. Um, but it had it introduced its new API, 2.0, which um, gave you pages. So suddenly, beginning in 2011, 2012, the di different data was available. Um, and and there was an ethics term. So, so this is why I say it's important to historicize your objects. So the pages became important. Now, this was probably the most famous uh, Facebook page, maybe of all time. Um, this is, this is the, 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 the page of the Egyptian uh, revolution, the Arab Spring, the, the Facebook, rev the social media revolution, the, right? So, so, so this is, uh, we are all, um, and we are all Khaled Said, um, and and this this is this is one that was was studied. Now, <clears throat> what we did was developed a couple of uh, kinds of uh, digital methods that that you'll read about. One is interliked page analysis. So this is a form of social network analysis because because pages can like other pages. So this this is one of the first. Um, Network graphs of of um, the extreme right in Europe, and we were, the, the the question was here: um, to what extent is there a pan-European extreme right, or are they quite national and isolated? So we did this on the on the basis of do extreme right pages like other extreme right pages, um, and can we derive a, a pan-European or, or or isolation from them? So the, the answer is somewhere in between, <laughs> as you can see. We also did something um, which I'm now showing this work. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't showing it at the time. This was, a, with, when they changed the API, they still allowed you to study groups. So we took the same um, list of, of extreme right groups in Europe, and we extracted, um, the extreme right groups, and then we, we found their groups on Facebook, and we found the group's administrator's name. This was a bit interesting, right? Um, and then we, did a, we made a network graph of it, um, and this was a little bit more troubling, um, because um, we, there were a couple of figures here uh, which were quite prominent um, as appearing across the, la the European landscape, and we were working at the time with an NGO, London-based NGO, Hope Not, Hope Not Hate, extremist, extremism researchers, who hadn't heard of half of these people. So, so it was the emergence of a, of a kind of new right that we had identified on using these methods. Maybe before I go there, that's a trigger warning. Um, I don't know if you do that here. Um, but what we found in, in studying these pages um, is that the most engaged with content, so those with the most interactions, uh, tended to be memes. And we have found that ever since. This is quite extreme content, so you might not want to stare at it for too long. But this was the, this was the, the, the meme um, that was most engaged with uh, by in this, in this particular space. Now, uh, I just want to mention... Um, what a, what a meme is, um, because it's oftentimes confused with viral, a viral and a meme. Uh, memes are, uh, according to Limar Schiffman and others, and this is something that I've been working on a lot lately, um, are collections of content, they're collections. And you contribute to a meme, and so you add to it. And so if, if you look at this, um, this adds to a particular understand, it adds to a kind of Islamophobia uh, um, 
The other thing is, is, is that um, uh, memes across most platforms, now I, I don't think it's the case yet for Telegram, but across most public facing platforms, the, it's the most engaged with content. Formerly it was thought, well, images are, or video, but it's more specific than that. Um, more recently, uh, of course, as you know, uh, Facebook was associated with the birth of the fake news crisis, right? So it was 2016. Um, <clears throat> this is the graphic that started it all. Uh, Craig Silverman of BuzzFeed News uh, published this uh, in um, November, I think it was, uh, of uh, 2016, where on Facebook, um, using quite straightforward data journalism techniques, found that the most engaged with uh, content about the US elections right before the actual elections was fake news. And he actually coined or recoined or appropriated the term fake news. This is where it started. Um, what, what I find interesting about this um, is, is the method. Um, and <clears throat> I want to just talk about that for a second. But we actually, we actually redid this um, using the same method. Uh, in, in the Netherlands. We were actually commissioned by the Dutch Ministry of Internal Affairs to study the, and this is not, this is not unusual. Uh, these studies were commissioned across Europe because of, the, because of the fake news crisis or the fake news scare, perhaps moral panic, however you want to talk about it. Um, uh, so we were commissioned to do the same. And um, <clears throat> so this was our graph. <clears throat> so in the Netherlands, uh, the mainstream was still sort of winning uh, the, the competition against. This is one election in, in 2019. <clears throat> this is, was the other election. But what I want to talk about is, is this study um, that I put out in the Harvard uh, Misinformation Review in, in 2020. And this was um, a more subtle um, point. <clears throat> and that is, what's the definition of fake news that you're using? Um, and how do you actually uh, code a source as fake or not? So this is, this is a big issue, <clears throat> obviously. Um, and so what I wanted to show you uh, is that <clears throat> this is the original definition by Craig Silverman. So above the line, those were fake. So. Um, they had disinformation, conspiracy, um, like front groups, fake advocacy organizations, um, but also <clears throat> uh, what he called hyperpartisan. Thank you. What he called hyperpartisan. And these were these what he called openly uh, ideological web operations. So <clears throat> if you um, if you include hyperpartisan groups, the problem is rather large. However, if you shift the definition of fake news and you remove hyperpartisan, the problem suddenly shrinks quite dramatically. And when the problem shrinks quite dramatically, you might think that, that you don't need to automate the solutions. You could use fact checking. In any case, um, the definition um, is uh, the, uh, the definitional issues are are are, uh, are important. That's one point. But the second point is that how do you code these 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 uh, these these sources? Um, so what we what we've been doing recently is we've been sort of using existing classification schemes and then triangulating them um, in order to tell whether a source is right leaning or left leaning or whether a source is uh, more pseudoscience or less pseudoscience, more conspiracy or less conspiracy. Okay, um, I want to move to Twitter. Um, and again, I want to historicize Twitter. I think uh, Twitter has been many, many different things over the years. Uh, I think it just changed again, but arguably it hasn't, and I want to talk about that as well, because I haven't put a Twitter 5 on here yet. Um, but, but Twitter 1 uh, was an innocent Twitter. Um, 
It was a very innocent Twitter. It was a what are you doing Twitter. Um, and it, it, it was often, oftentimes called the what I had for lunch medium, you know? Um, and it's interesting, it was, it was also called um, sort of really banal. Um, this is the original Twitter sketch. This is Jack Dorsey's sketch of what Twitter uh, was to be. And it was, um, this is from 2006, it was, it, was, it was four young urbanites, young San Francisco urbanites. Um, and you see that there are two default um, statuses. You're either in bed or going to the park. I mean, I, mean, I quite like this lifestyle. Um, you also see that, that originally that the proposal was a domain hack, status, stat.us, status, right? So this is this idea of, it's a status update. So you're updating your status. It was also for um, two ideas, which I find, two concepts, or, or three maybe, or two, which I find quite interesting. It was for kind of ambient friend following. Um, so... It might have been banal to a lot of people, but it wasn't banal to, if you're friends, right? So, so you could achieve rem, remote intimacy. So this was the idea of Twitter. And this is what we have now with messaging apps, right? But this was the, the, the original idea uh, behind Twitter. Now, something happened quite dramatically um, around 2009, where Twitter, uh, well, first of all, it changed its motto or its invitation um, from what are you doing to what's happening. Um, now, you might think of this as quite prosaic, um, but it coincided with this, the Twitter revolution. Uh, and, the, and in fact, this was Dorsey in, an, in a, in a two-part interview in the Los Angeles Times at the time, talked about how Twitter was doing quite well at events. Um, and And began to think of it as an event-following medium, not as an ambient friend-following medium, but as an event-following medium. So along those lines, what we did uh, was to think, well, how can we actually turn it into an event-following machine? So how do you do that? Um, so what we did is, is we came up with, 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 with some methods um, these were relatively simple ones, but, but powerful ones. So we, these were applied to the Iran election crisis of 2009. Well, what we did was we took um, uh, the top tweets by retweet per day, the top three, and put them in chronological order as opposed to the reverse chron chronological order of, that, that Twitter provides. And, and through it, we're able to provide a sort of a kind of day-by-day -day account um, of what was going on on the streets and in Twitter uh, about the Iran election crisis for a 30-day period. So this, this was a piece of work that, in fact, we exhibited uh, on, a, on a few... Actually, we exhibited this in Madrid at a, at a gallery. Um, and also this, this was published. We also developed a few other techniques, and I, I want to show you <clears throat> maybe two uh, quickly, um, probably ones that you've never done before. Um, that's why I'm showing them uh, to you. Uh, one is um, um, issue space analysis. So there's lots and lots of things you can do with Twitter data. Uh, but let me just recommend two. Um, so this first one is, is to study Twitter not as an event space, but as an issue space. Um, and so what one does normally is, is, is you, you make a list of hashtags and or keywords for, of an issue, uh, query uh, Twitter, get the data back. I do a two-step data collection routine. I then make a, a hashtag frequency list, and I take the hashtags that, I for, that, that newly appeared, add them to my original list, and query it again. It's more robust data set. Maybe this is a geeky thing to say right now. But anyway, and then, and then I do these three things. I do a hashtag analysis, hashtag frequency, co-hashtag, um, graphs. Um, I do an app mention analysis. Um, who's being mentioned? This site called dominant voice. Who's the dominant voice? They're the ones that are being mentioned the most. 
who's the most vocal, the ones who's, who's tweeting the most. That's less significant. And also a URL uh, analysis, and I'll just show you that. Um, so this is, this is one that we did around the, the first uh, uh, Trump election, Trump versus Hillary, uh, and looking at the, the URLs uh, most um, tweeted in tweets by Trump supporters versus Hillary supporters. And then you see, of course, this kind of polarization in action. You see very few shared URLs. But what you also see, if you know these sources, um, is, is that the Trump ones are, are quite extreme. Um, so if, if, I mean, now we think this is, or I don't know if we found it, find it normal, um, but that the, this, not, when, it's not just polarization that we're mapping, right? It's, 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 it's more than that. It's, um, it's, it's what the forms that they assume. And I think that's important. Um, so when, when we just talk about polarization, we say, well, um, you know, they're divided. Yes, they're divided because they don't share the same URLs. But if you look at the types of URLs that are shared the most by, by for example, Trump here, they're, very, they're quite extreme sources. I want to show you one more thing. Um, Twitter doesn't want you to do this. Um, it's actually, if you look at the developer terms of service, it says, do not segment an audience. Um, but they, they say that they, that's more for, that's directed at government, um, um, mainly, um, not at academic researchers. And, and so what I want to show you is a technique um, <clears throat> to segment an audience. Um, and this particular um, technique I'll just, uh, I'll just show you uh, what it looks like, or I can I can leave this up here for a second. So what we did is we um, we were working with uh, <clears throat> the Home Office of the UK, that's the UK um, Ministry of Internal Affairs, the Counter Terrorism uh, Unit, and <clears throat> they gave us a list of the most hardcore alt right actors. Um, because they were concerned about the alt-right moving from the US to the UK and then to continental Europe. And then they, they, they were wondering, uh, it's like, well, how big is this movement uh, on Twitter? Uh, or how powerful um, is, uh, is that grouping? And I was thinking, hmm, that's, I don't know how to answer that. But what I could do is um, take this set of actors, and then I could <clears throat> find out who's mentioning them. And so this is a relatively simple technique, um, but um, so this, and this is quite shocking, in fact, in, in a way. So the ones in blue uh, mention all eight of the hardcore alt-right, and you see it's Trump. This is, um, this is 20, 20, 2017, 2018. Um, so then you can, so then you identify immediately the, the sort of core, the core's core, um, and then um, which users mention seven of them, which users mention six, which users mention five, which users mention four. So we're basically, quote unquote, segmenting an audience because they're retweeting or otherwise mentioning. Now, this is a research technique, huh? so we're not spying. Um, that's why it's against the, the Twitter terms of service in the developer mode, where we're doing research. <clears throat> Yet, um, for a time, a relatively short amount of time, I, I, I don't know if you remember this, um, but, but Twitter suddenly became this sort of generic data set that people were using to predict anything or try to. Um, and it didn't go well. <laughs> it, did, it didn't go well at all. Um, so this was one of, one of the papers. This is, I mean, this is goofy academic humor, so you don't have to find it funny, but... Um, this is typical. I, I wanted to predict elections with Twitter, and all I got was this lousy paper. So, so it, didn't, it didn't work. 
Um, and so there was, or there's, there was a, there's a recent paper out um, by a German colleague who did a, did a 20 year survey, or 20, maybe 20, 15, 12 year survey of all the attempts to predict things using Twitter data. Um, and he, he drew a lot of conclusions. He was the first one, I mean, apart from, apart from um, these, this, this colleague, he was the first one to say that it can't predict elections. And he, and he based that finding on the fact that for the German elections in, now I can't remember the exact date, but in 2010 sometime, that, that according to Twitter data, the pirate party should have been huge um, when it wasn't. Um, so this was the first sense that, that social media data is sort of it skews in particular directions. But then, you know, subsequent researchers thought about, well, how can we take it, how can we sort of work with this skew or, or, or do it differently? Now, the big problem is this, um, and, and this is that, that, it's, that it's not representative. And it's interesting that, it, that if you go country by country, there have been a few studies that do this, not that many, but if you go country by country, the difference in how Twitter is representative is different. Sorry, the, the, the extent to which Twitter is representative of the population in a particular country is different country by country. Um, so not only is it generally not representative, but it's representative in, a, in different, in, in, it's skewed differently per country. Um, there are, there's been a lot of research that, that's done interesting work to get around this problem. For example, taking just um, European parliamentarians, most European parliamentarians across all European countries are on Twitter. Um, and that's an interesting, interesting data set because they, they're tweeting behaviors, they're at mentioning behaviors, their following behaviors uh, are then quite typical. Um, or you can compare them to how to how they whether they vote together or not. Um, but nevertheless, this is a, this is an issue. Um, and so people will then say, well, um, you know, we made these findings about society according to Twitter. Right? So it was always this according to Twitter part. Um, so However, more recently, I think the emphasis on uh, what to study on Twitter has changed. Uh, this is the, one of the famous uh, studies uh, that got a lot of uh, airtime uh, on how misogynistic uh, Twitter is. This is the study of female politicians and female journalists. Um, you could add female academics to this as well. Um, the amount of trolling, uh, et cetera, that, that, that takes place. Um, this is a famous data journalism piece. Uh, you've probably seen it or maybe heard of it. Um, the six, 567 people, places, and things Donald Trump has insulted on Twitter. This is before he was deplatformed. Uh, of course, he was been replatformed, um, which I want to talk about in a second. Um, I found um, Jack Dorsey's description of why it was that Twitter deplatformed Trump to be very, very thoughtful. Um, I think it's worth spending some time reading this. His understanding of what the internet is for, um, what free speech is, what free speech is not. Uh, it's very nuanced uh, and doesn't get my, very much attention. But what I want to talk about um, is uh, some work that we did um, uh, this is published in 2020. Um, so what happens after deplatforming? So, and what is, is deplatforming good and for whom? Um, is it good for the platforms? Is it good for the internet? Is it good for society at large? Um, so this is some of the questions, I mean, the last question is quite difficult. Uh, to answer empirically. But one of the things that we did um, was we made this map. Uh, this is one of the first um, maps published uh, of, of the rise of alt tech uh, and the extent to which um, um, these particular extreme internet personalities who are deplatformed have gone to alt tech and which alt techs uh, and, and, and then also whether or not particular mainstream platforms are still relevant to them. Uh, so YouTube and Twitter are still relevant. 
to these in extreme internet personalities, whereas they really despise Facebook and Instagram. That's interesting because deplatforming was good for Instagram and Facebook, so to speak. Um, but what I want to show you is this. This is, the, this is the extreme internet personalities, some 20 of them that we studied, that had migrated, they were thrown off of Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, and migrated to Telegram. So the question was, you know, are they still extreme? Um, uh, do, uh, are these alt tech platforms, do they give these extreme internet personalities oxygen? What we found was, was um, we found that they had an audience there that's much smaller. Um, they still post a lot. But what we found was that the, the use of, of extreme language went down, which is counterintuitive, perhaps. Like, why aren't they extreme on extreme? Why, why aren't they extreme on extreme platforms when they were on extreme on, on mainstream platforms? Because maybe they're in the business Maybe they're not so extreme after all. Maybe they're in the business of angertainment, you know, like this new word. Um, so this is an interesting, the, the interesting thing to, uh, to, to research more empirically. Um, so this is the latest. So Musk's Twitter uh, is, is apparently more toxic, and this is the NYU research. It's interesting that if you look at uh, Twitter's rules, that they have not changed. Um, they have, um, Musk gets a lot of uh, attention because of his erratic behavior, let's call it. Um, uh, but when you look at the extent to which, and this is something that I invite you to do, I've done this with some of my students, if you look at those accounts that have been reinstated, how many of them are tweeting? Uh, and are they toxic? Um, the, the, great, the big example is Trump. He has not come back. You can go and look at at real Donald Trump on Twitter. It's very interesting. It's frozen in time. It's at, right before he was deplatformed. The last tweet saying, by the way, I'm not attending the uh, inauguration, if anyone's asking. It's very interesting. It's, it's this sort of archived um, frozen time. OK. Um, I, how are we feeling? Yeah, shall I do one more platform? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do Instagram just because Instagram seems lighter, um, but it's not. Um, <laughs> okay, so I wanna talk about Instagram. Um, Instagram is, is, is interesting. This is the first um, Instagram uh, post. It's a, um, so it's not a cat, right? Um, so this is Kevin Sistrom. Um, this is his dog. So Kevin Sistrom's the founder of Instagram. This is the, the first post. It's his dog and his girlfriend's foot. So it's something like a family selfie, not quite. Um, but this is what, of course, it was originally most known for. Um, it was considered this sort of selfie uh, medium. Um, therefore, I mean, like, like all the others, right? They start out so innocent, right? So here, here's me and here are my interests on Facebook. Um, amb ambient friend following, what I had for lunch on Twitter. Similarly, um, selfie. I told you about the, the, some of the earliest research on selfies, the Selfie City Project by Lev Manovich. Um, which, is, um, which is interesting to, to look up. It's int what's also interesting is, is that um, th there's not really an ethics statement with this, with this. I mean, there's all these selfies of all, you know, I'm not sure we would do this um, now. Um, I think, I mean, I, ha I put 2014 here. Um, I, I think I put 2014 here because of this and this, um, which also hit uh, Instagram. Um, so Instagram, so I think it was, the, the reason for 2014, I think this, this is the year that Kevin Systrom said that I want Instagram to be more like Twitter in the sense of 
a serious news following or event following medium. Um, other commentary has suggested, well, that's quite silly of you, Mr. System, because Instagram has over a billion views. I mean, it's much bigger, right? So you, you wouldn't necessarily want to aspire to be Twitter, which has you know, 350 million users when you have well over a billion. But nevertheless, I think he sensed perhaps that, 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 that Instagram was becoming a more a serious, where, um, and this is also in the scholarship, uh, where these terms initiated on Twitter, but then they were later applied uh, to Instagram, this idea of antagonistic hashtags uh, and hashtag publics. Um, so um, thinking along those lines, so the, here, are, so this is Black Lives Matter, this is All Lives Matter. Of course, they were like Blue Lives Matter and the rest, right? Um, so this is one of the, one of the uh, techniques that we use uh, in digital methods um, in query design, we call it. There's a, there's a paper on that that I haven't referenced here, but you can read it, query design. So oftentimes, hashtags are in competition with one another. So when you, when you, when you do a research project, um, you can just query one side of the issue and study it, or you can, or you can query two sides and, and study the competition. Uh, this is a technique um, that was put forward by Bruno Latour, um, the French anthropologist, philosopher of, of, of science, program, anti-program. So that we did this work um, around the US Supreme Court ruling same sex, on same-sex marriage, love wins, and then the antagonistic hashtag or celebrate pride, and then the antagonistic hashtag um, Jesus wins. So first we studied filter activism, um, like this, uh, but then we, we geolocated um, who was using these hashtags. So this is the sort of you know, geolocating hate, so to speak. Um, this is harder to do. Um, this, is, this is recent work that we've done on the, uh, around the Dutch uh, elections. Th these are, these are follow follower networks. This is big data analysis. I was speaking with uh, the Signal Lab people. I guess you guys do this. That's an achievement. Um, so uh, learn it. It's not that easy to do. It's big data. Um, okay, the, the last one I want to talk about is the most recent era. I mean, of course, now Instagram is a... Uh, um, and this is, the, this is where I'll conclude. Uh, so Instagram is, is associated with, with influencers, as you know. Um, influencers, there are a couple of terms which I like uh, when studying influencers. And one has to do with the front stage work, the staging work, that's visibility labor. Uh, the other has to do with uh, creating and maintaining a fan base. That's called relational labor. So on both of these, um, there are, there's a lot of work on how these things have been automated. Um, and I wanna just show you one, uh, and that is um, fake followers. I don't know if you are familiar with, with this market. It's a massive market. Instagram is the, is the, the most, is the largest fake follower market. There's a market for TikTok which I think is rising. I, don't, I, don't, I think Instagram is still here and TikTok's here. Twitter is down here, um, uh, but for, for fakes. And so it's, it's interesting to think about um, how to derive this. So this is an information graphic that we made for the book, um, The Politics of Social Media Manipulation, came out in 2020. Um, and these are... Um, um, these are politicians on the bottom. Those are uh, media organizations at the top. So what, um, if you begin studying fake followers, what you quickly find out is that on average, uh, people who are fairly significant on Instagram have about this amount. So that's, so that's normal, around 20%. So you see anything that is far on the right, sort of like 35, 40% is highly suspect. And also those who have very, very few, they're also very interesting to study. So those who care, really care, and have heavily groomed, 
heavily groomed uh, profiles. Um, and so they're watching who's following um, and then removing those who they don't feel are worthy, um, which is a completely different um, type of, um, of, of analysis. Okay, so I'm going to um, end it there. Um, what, I'm, what I just want to just wrap up by saying that I, I, I put digital methods in a historical perspective, right? As being something that, that came at a particular period of time. Um, it, the, it, it came in a particular time when things like the mashup was popular, where you would take data from one platform and another platform and go like this. Now, this is, has become a lot harder, uh, of course. Um, and, and the discussions of the post-digital also are, are go hand in hand with discussions of the post-API era um, and thinking what that, what that entails. So does that mean small data? Does that mean ethnography? Does that mean scraping? Um, does that mean relying in Europe on the Digital Services Act where they have to provide data to academics? Um, but that's, that's skewed internationally, of course. Um, I also wanted, I also talked about digital methods as quite specific. It doesn't have to be, you know, you could just use the umbrella term like digital research methods or whatever, but, but, but it tried to be a new way of doing research with the internet, looking at the opportunities instead of coming with a methodological framework or coming with a, you know, um, no, I'm doing critical discourse analysis. Okay, that's fine. But what we're doing with digital methods is we're looking for research opportunities. So what are the objects that are available? What can we do with them? How can we re repurpose the methods of the medium? So this is the outlook. And then I gave you some examples. Um, if you want more examples, come tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Okay, yeah. thanks very much. Wow, muchas gracias, Dr. Rogers. Y bueno, tenemos algunos minutos para abrir los micrófonos a la audiencia para algunas preguntas. Entiendo, no sé si se registraron preguntas eh, a quienes están en la distancia. Entonces, pues el micrófono queda abierto para ustedes. Allá lo tiene Víctor Hugo. Pero no lo sabe prender. Ahí está. Ahí ya tienes la primera. Hi. I have a very specific question about uh, the thing you were talking about, memes, and memes inside, like, political content, or as political content. Uh, have you ever developed or, like, think about a methodology to, like, talk about memes as their own thing and not as part of something bigger, I don't know if that makes sense. Because I, I don't know, I, I've, I've thought that memes are their own thing in political discourse and political groups and political like pages. And they are very popular and they're very, very like, they have a unique way of communicating things, but sometimes when you analyze memes inside like something bigger, uh, those analyses lose something about like the characteristics, and they I don't know I don't know if this makes sense. Like, no, it, it you make sense. Um, so I think this is on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll just preface my my response by saying that I just published a paper on this. So you can. It's called "What Is a Meme?" Technically speaking, it's in Information Communication and Society, the, this journal. So you can look up that if you want to. Um, so that's more specific, but just here. Um, so the, 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 the Russian misinformation, or the Russian influence campaign during the 2016 US elections, which is very famous, um, it was found that the content that was most engaged with on Instagram uh, were memes, by far. So it's an effective 
means of political campaigning, political communication, uh, in the sense that it, it's, it's, it's interacted with most significantly, okay? So, so this is something that's been empirically determined. Um, I have found the same in most every issue space that I've studied, that the, the memes are the, are, are the, the most specific. And so this is this is where this is what digital methods do, right? It's a, it's an engagement study, um, and it's an engagement study of a format. And this format is a, is normally an image macro. It's a two liner, right? There's an opening thought and there's a closing thought, um, and and then you can study these image macros um, in a in a in a political space or an issue space over time. And you can see the extent to which they're adding to the meme or they're, they're um, creating new, th new thoughts, new thought completions, because right? memes are additive content. Right? So this is, this is how I, I, I would study it if, if I were you. Now, the problem, and this is, what, I was, this is the, what I've contributed in this paper with a colleague of mine from the University of Milan, the, the problem is, is where to source these memes. Because um, if you source them from Google image search, you get one kind of meme. If you source them from Facebook, you get another kind of meme. If you source them from, well, Facebook meaning CrowdTangle, I don't know if you use CrowdTangle as a data source here, but if you use CrowdTangle's meme search, what, what it returns to you um, is, um, is anything that has image over text. So memes become this, this technical format. So what you get back are not image macros, but you get back uh, screenshots of tweets, you get back uh, social cards, like placards. Anyway, so, um, so what I'm saying is that this idea that I just gave you of how to study memes over time and how they add to a particular story or, or, or don't will change depending on the medium in which you're studying the memes. You see? Okay, so you have then some options. You can choose your platform carefully, um, or you can try to triangulate, um, but it gets, uh, it gets messy if you do multiple platforms. So what you end up studying is um, meme culture per platform, and not the campaign. You see? So, um, yeah. Bueno, pues. bueno, si no, acá tenemos otra. Ah, perdón. Um, hello, um, my question for you, doctor, is um, in this uh, digital era in which we are living, uh, what do you think um, that, well, for you, what are uh, the, the main um, causes about uh, the toxic environment in the Twitter of Elon Musk era? Uh, what makes you think that uh, Elon Musk uh, didn't? Um, how say? I'm sorry, I'm searching for the correct word for not. Um, you can say it in Spanish. <laughs> um, what makes you think that Elon Musk didn't um, mejorar uh, this, this, improved this? Uh, problem inside Twitter that, as we saw in your presentation, has a lot of years happening. Okay, that's a that's a really simple question with a really complex answer, um, <laughs> or maybe complex question. And I'll give a simple answer. No, okay, so it's a it's a simple question. Um, so there's a lot of things going on um, at the same time. Um, so I'll name three, and I, I'm just I'll just kind of sketch them out. So. So what, why, why, why are platforms toxic? Why do I think that? Um, so so the, 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 the first reason is, um, is, let's call it the algorithmic. Um, so, so platforms are, are boosting um, those posts which receive the most interactions, um, those have tended to be posts that elicit emotion. So this is quite well known, right? The 
emotive posts. Now, <clears throat> so if, if they're, it, so it becomes a vicious circle. So if, if platforms boost posts that are angry, then you get more and more, ang you get angrier and angrier posts at the top, right? So this is a, a vicious circle. So this is number one. Um, number two is that if you're a, if you're a platform performer, right? If I'm, a, if I'm a YouTuber or if I'm an influencer, if I'm a, what content works? Um, and this is what I was talking about previously uh, with, the, um, with, those, with the study on those who, internet celebrities who got deplatformed and moved to Telegram. Suddenly their offensive language went down. Um, so, so, so they, the, in order to perform well, in, in order to be boosted algorithmically, you you want to be in the business of angertainment, uh, or in the business of, you know, stunts or, <clears throat> you know, extreme content. Extreme content. Um, so that's 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 the second thing. Um, but I think the I think the third thing <clears throat> is you're getting. Um, I mean, people talk about echo chambers. Echo chambers are different from filter bubbles, right? So filter bubbles are algorithmic, and echo chambers are, are human to human. Um, and so you, what we're getting are, are increasingly are portions of the internet right? um, as well. Uh, so I think it's these three factors. Uh, there's a fourth one, and <clears throat> it has to do with the effectiveness of content moderation. Um, and this is where Musk comes in. So I think a, a lot of the content moderation now is being more and more automated. Um, cer certainly at, more so now at Twitter. In, as a, I mean, Facebook does the most non, most human content moderation, whereas, whereas Telegram, um, uh, TikTok, it, it's, it's almost purely automated. So as we move as we move to purely automated um, content moderation, the question is 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 you know to what extent will that be effective in removing the toxicity? So what you're now seeing is a whole kind of especially on TikTok a whole generation of using coded language. I mean it's it's all about um, you know ev like like not triggering the automated moderation. It's, and so maybe that's a hope, you know? I mean, it's an odd hope to have, right? So that, that's, 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 that's people become so aware of, of automated moderation that they, that they couch their speech in such a way so that it won't trigger it, thereby creating a less obviously toxic medium, but perhaps one that's more insidious because it's subtle toxicity. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Eh, Allá tenemos otra. Fíjense aquí para que escuchen en la transmisión. Y esta, perdón, pero ya por tiempo es la última, porque afuera tenemos un brindis para que nos acompañen. The last one, doctor. With the arrival of the artificial, artificial, artificial intelligence, eh, eh, how do you think this will impact these uh, digital methods? I mean, it, it seems like artificial intelligence is it's invading uh, every aspect of our lives. So I still have a voice. Um, it sounds like it's a bit scratchy, but I can, I can answer the question. But thank you for saying that it's the last one, but I can answer another one if you want. Okay, um, <clears throat> so, so there are a few things. Um, so, what what we, um, we my colleagues and I we, we we try to develop this notion of query design, right? So that's that's develop like that's formulating queries in order to be able to sort of answer research questions. And I gave you one example of that: the program anti-program. Okay, so what about prompt design? How do you do that? Um, so right now, most prompt design is trying to 
tease out what's lurking deep within the machine, if you know what I mean. Like trying to show that it's ultimately probably quite, well, maybe evil even. That's a, I know that's a strong word. Uh, or, you know, like trying to, I don't know, a, a colleague of mine yesterday, uh, or yesterday, um, said, um, we're gaslighting AI. We're trying to convince it that it's nuts, right? Um, and that's one kind of prompt design. How do you do that differently? Um, so how do we make that productive? I think that this is one of the questions for, for digital methods or digital research methods, you know? So that this is one. But a lot of other ones we've already been doing for quite some time, and, that, and that's, and, and we're throwing the word AI around as if it hasn't been around. Um, for a long time, so a lot of the work that um, many of us have been doing is is called algorithmic auditing. You know, so so what we're trying to do, and and, and um, I have some work coming out on this on on Google Auto Suggest. So we're we're prompting it um, in order to um, seek vulnerabilities, exploits, etc. But also. Um, I mean, it's critical work, uh, but it's also we're we're making it we're making it um, we're making it public, and the question is, I mean, this is this is one of the interesting questions about the future of um, working with the AI, working with AI or researching AI. Is will we continue to critique it, or will we more often serve it? So, for example, I'll just I'll tell you one quick story. Um, uh, we've been studying fact checkers um, at, um, at one of the largest fact checking organizations in, in, in Europe, the AFP, uh, which is the, the, the French newswire. They have a huge fact checking unit. And Facebook asks them to actually read and be journalists. And, and so, is this, is, is this a fact or, is this, or does this need to be debunked? TikTok, on the other hand, hires them um, to um, label videos. They hire them to, to train the AI, right? So to not be journalists any longer, but to feed the machine, right? So I think, I think we should ask ourselves a question when, when we're thinking about the, the future of working with AI, because it's like working with AI. Um, uh, will we only feed it? Will we only train it? Um, yeah, so that's the critical question. Bueno, pues eh, muchísimas gracias. Dejamos ahí ese diálogo abierto. Gracias. Y eh, les esperamos mañana. También inviten a más de sus colegas a las 11 de la mañana en este mismo espacio. Gracias. <laughs>